then it really got me thinking beyond myself and like, well, what's, what's my, what is my piece of this big puzzle? And how much am I missing out on the ease of life because I think it's supposed to show up a certain way or happen a certain way? Or how can I possibly um, go through life just ex looking at what's around me and expect that I'm going to know what's best for the overall picture whenever I only get like a little piece of it? And that led me to like kind of looking at the blueprint of the body and just understanding that for however we were created, whatever put me here, design my body, and my body runs very efficiently given certain circumstances. With the right nutrition, the right exercise, my body really thrives, and that's just the human body in general. So while I'm trying to figure out my purpose and why I'm here and all of that, if I'm ever going to really hit my full potential, if I'm ever going to really live into that, whatever it is that I'm here for, how can I really reach my full potential if I'm not even following the guidelines and the blueprint on how to run the human body. Does that make sense? It did to me at the time. Of course, then I was like, where did that come from? How did I even come to that thought? I don't know, but it came to me. And I think it came to me because I kept asking how. Like, what's going on? What's going on? I was determined to find out what it is, so I just opened myself and I started receiving the answers. And they came from within me instead of from around me. And uh, getting to, you know, okay, well, since I don't know what my purpose is and I don't know how to really reach and live into that full potential, what I do know is that in the meantime, I might as well be fueling my body with what it needs so my body can run how it's supposed to, so my brain can function how it's supposed to, so I can have the chemical reactions and have those light bulbs go off and have those thoughts and have that, that clear thinking while I'm trying to figure out all this stuff. And little did I know that that was going to lead into so much more. But it all began, if you listen to everything that I've just shared with you, it all began with becoming aware of myself. Aware of my individuality, aware of my uniqueness, aware of the fact that there's only me, and aware of the fact that my potential, or my the possibility of me living into my full potential, is it, it's factored beyond just knowing what my purpose is. It's factored beyond just simply having motivation. It actually all kind of synergistically works together as this amazing machine called the human body given the right circumstances. But I couldn't pretend to be in my full potential if I was still kind of um, not following the stuff that I did know. So while I'm searching for what I don't know, I'm going to start implementing what I do know. And once I started implementing that, when I took the blinders off on what I ate, then as I started implementing these things and, and discovering these things about myself and thinking deeper and deeper and deeper into that whole what's going on here way of looking at things, that's where things really started to shift and I became more aware. And I'm talking like more aware beyond, you know, um, my self-talk. Like I got to a whole new level of self-talk. I had hit a point of monitoring my self-talk that I thought that I pretty much had it under control, but boy, was I wrong. I had like a whole new sneaky level of self-talk that had kind of snuck in there, a whole new level of stories that I started un unraveling and revealing about myself. But it all begins with awareness. If you don't know where the problem lies, when I don't know where the problem lies, I don't know where to begin. And when I don't know where to begin, then I just surrender it to, to asking. Because I'm a firm believer, we cannot, I, I don't believe it's possible for us to ask a question to which we already don't hold the answer to. It's just a matter of actually getting the question out there and quieting the mind enough to hear the answer from within. And how that shows up for people, it's, it shows up for people in different ways. But if you don't know that there's two conversations going on inside you, one controlled by the head and one that's controlled by the heart, you're not ever going to hear what your heart's trying to tell you if you're always letting your mind override it. So that suffering, I believe, that suffering, that, that, uh, that feeling, that desire to change inside is really just our heart trying to get a word in edgewise, trying to get listened to, trying to get heard, trying to guide us through our life. But we have blinders on, on how it's supposed to look and how our guidance is supposed to look, but we've been listening to up here for so long, we don't even know that it down here has a voice. We've just kind of conditioned ourselves out of listening to it to keep us safe and to keep us 
secure and to keep us comfortable and is creating our own misery and our own suffering. It was creating my own misery and own suffering. And that's where all of it comes down to. And the beautiful thing, again, about all this is that when you know what's really causing the problem, you can address that. You can address that instead of just trying to pacify the symptoms. I feel bad when so-and-so talks to me this way, so I'm going to avoid dealing with that person. You're not addressing what's causing you to feel that way. You're just addressing the symptom. Well, just because you remove the, the things that push your buttons, it doesn't mean that your buttons disappear. And no matter who pushes your buttons, they're still your buttons. And until you figure out how to deactivate them or what's causing them, then you have no control over your life. You have to We've just kind of conditioned ourselves out of listening to it to keep us safe and to keep us secure and to keep us comfortable. And it's creating our own misery and our own suffering. It was creating my own misery and own suffering. And that's where all of it comes down to. And the beautiful thing, again, about all this is that when you know what's really causing the problem, you can address that. You can address that instead of just trying to pacify the symptoms. I feel bad when so-and-so talks to me this way, so I'm going to avoid dealing with that person. You're not addressing what's causing you to feel that way. You're just addressing the symptom. Well, just because you remove the, the things that push your buttons, it doesn't mean that your buttons disappear. And no matter who pushes your buttons, they're still your buttons. And until you figure out how to deactivate them or what's causing them, then you have no control over your life. You have no control. So in growing my awareness, I became really aware of the physical effects that took place in my body when I experienced different emotions. When I experienced different circumstances and, and went through different experiences, I started paying attention. In a way, I feel like I kind of reconnected my head to my body. And I didn't really realize how disconnected the two were until they got reconnected. But I had noticed through massage work, through doing massage for people, that a lot of people aren't aware what goes on in their body physically. Like a lot of times, people will come to me and they're like, oh, my low back hurts. And then as I start working on them, then they realize, wow, I've got a lot of stuff going on in my neck too. And there'll be like a lot of tenderness in the neck. But they didn't feel that until I put my pressure on them. It doesn't mean that it's not there. They just weren't feeling the symptoms. And why they weren't feeling the neck pain with the low back pain at the same time is because the body just cannot process all the sensations that are going on at one time or else we'd be in overwhelm. I mean, if you think about it, you don't even feel the clothes that are on your body, but you know that they're there. And if your mind was constantly registering every sensation, we probably wouldn't even be able to move. We'd be in such overwhelm of everything that's going on. So our bodies, our minds are amazing machines. They're amazing, amazing organs. And what our minds do, they filter out what we deem is not important or not necessary. Filter out what's not necessary and then they turn a lot of attention to things. That our mind is not really designed to be our friend and kind of help us guide us through some kind of thriving, successful life. Our mind is an organ, just like our heart, just like our lungs. It has a specific purpose, and it functions very much like an organ. And the, the main function of our mind is to keep us alive. That's it. To keep us safe and to keep us alive. So it's an amazing system where once a, an instance occurs, it can kind of file it away in our memory bank, and then we can know what to look out for. So if you're walking along and you fall in a hole and you get injured, the next time you walk along that same path, you're going to watch for that hole because that's how your mind's programmed. The hole is important. You might not notice all the trees and the flowers and the butterflies because they're not a threat, but your mind is focused on watch out for holes. So it really serves us. But what happens is, or what's happened in our society, what happened to me, is that nobody's ever told me that that's all that my mind's for. In fact, especially since I started my personal development journey, I've learned that you are your thoughts, that I am my thoughts, and that my thoughts create things, but I am my thoughts. So I'm listening to this voice that's going through my head, and I'm thinking that that's who I am. And it, that's very misleading. It's a very, <coughs> excuse me. Your thoughts that go through your head is your safety mechanism, and that's it. That's it. So we've got all this responsibility that we've handed over to our mind to make decisions for us 
and to know what's best without understanding that it's only going to point out the dangers. It's only going to point out what we need to look out for. And that along with this amazing, amazing organ that we have to keep us safe and alive, we've also been given like an inner GPS, our inner guidance system to let us know when we're on track and when we're not. And when you can learn to listen to both of these voices instead of just one, or one 80% and the other one 20%, because I mean, let's face it, we're still really good people. I mean, amongst all the fear and everything, we still have people that we do let in, and we still we have people that we are close with, and we have people that we love to pieces, and we have people that we just really shine around. But then when we were thrown into an unfamiliar situation, we get into that protective kind of mode, and then you don't, I know I didn't for a long time want to make the first move because I didn't know what was going to happen if I did. I didn't know if I was going to be accepted or rejected. I didn't know if I would know what to say or not know what to say. I didn't know if I'd be fully equipped or not fully equipped. And what I have learned through this journey is that we all simply are fully equipped, but the answer lies within us, and that's, that's the only place that we're ever going to find the strength, the courage, the compassion, the love, whatever it is that we're seeking. This is the only place that you're ever going to find it. Or at least what I believe to be true. I was making a point before I got off track a little bit. Yes. Oh, the inner GPS. Our inner GPS, this inner guidance system. And it's it's that that all those positive emotions, that happiness, that feel good, that ease, that laughter, that lightness, that fun, that excitement, that adventure, that just that ooh, like the inner child doing a happy dance. That is the signal that we're on track. <laughs> That's the, in, the signal that we're on the right path in, in, in the flow of life. And once I started really tasting that and feeling that more often, that's what I wanted more of. And it's only whenever I start listening up here that I start getting that heaviness in my chest and like that kind of tightness and that kind of anxious, anxiety, sort of uneasy, yucky sensation, whatever's not love. So once I could start feeling the physical reactions that took place in my body, when I don't like a situation, I feel something really heavy and pressing on my chest and I start to kind of tighten up and um, have a hard time breathing and focusing my attention and I just get really scared. It's kind of like a close off feeling. And when I'm feeling great, I feel just like open and amazing and just happy and just want to skip and sing and dance and run. And a lot of times I do that right there in the moment because I'm feeling it and I love that feeling and that's what I want more of. So any time that I started feeling this like pressure and this anxiety, started feeling the physical effects that would take place in my body when undesirable situations would occur, instead of taking it and just like pouring myself into it, like, oh, I'm so miserable, I'm so scared, I need to prepare, or whatever, getting caught up in that emotion, instead of running down that path, I instead took that heaviness and that anxiety and that, that feeling when it would first come on, and I would use it as an indicator to make a different choice. So instead of letting my emotions run my life and uh, steer me in whatever direction felt good in the moment, I could feel that feeling and instead of getting caught up and lost in it, just simply make a choice to do something different. And it took recognizing that feeling after the fact and then eventually recognizing the feeling in the fact to eventually being able to stop it and making a choice before I really got into that feeling so it's just a kind of like a reconditioning and a reawareness, but taking the blinders off on, on what I was physically.